It's a pleasure to welcome uh, James Kirby, uh, who's flown in from Brisbane uh, today. Um, just by way of background, um, there's a very famous guy in the UK called Paul Gilbert, who's been doing a lot of work over many years to do with compassion. He wrote a book called Compassionate Mind, and he's come up with the idea of compassion-focused therapy. And he heads a very, very active email group that I'm a part of. One of the most active people is James. And his posts are never, ever a waste of time. They're just fantastic. And as a result of all of this email, you know, seeing him on emails when I was in Brisbane a couple of years ago, we met up and, uh, and have stayed in touch. Um, through your uh, one year at uh, Stanford, we you know, remain in touch. And um, I've been just so impressed by the things that James has been doing. Actually, at that time that we met, you were still working on uh, the Positive Parenting Program. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, very great breadth of interest. But since then, um, one of the many things, and I don't think we're going to talk about it today, unfortunately, is um, a wonderful uh, scale that James has developed to measure both compassion and self-compassion, each of which has three subscales. Um, I've seen you know, some early versions of it, and, and I think it's really very good, wait, awaiting publication. <laughs> um, and, and another really important thing that, uh, that happened in the intervening couple of years since we met is uh, he became a parent. Um, and uh, I think we're going to enormously enjoy uh, the talk today. Uh, about compassion. I'm sure when you leave here, you will know so much more. <laughs> so thank you, James. Oh, thanks for that pleasure. <laughs> uh, well, that was a, a very lovely introduction. So thank you very much for what you shared. And, um, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm a little tired. Um, my little boy uh, kept me up last night, um, so I'm very angry towards him. But <laughs> I was like, Tell me, don't you know I've got an important talk? Um, <laughs> it didn't work. Um, so, but no, it's an absolute uh, joy to be here. And um, uh, I'll be talking to you a little bit about some of the work we're doing um, up at the University of Queensland. And I think um, already, you know, your um, Institute of uh, Positive Psychology and Education uh, you know, have done so much work in the pro-social space, so some of the things I perhaps will be mentioning might be things you're already well aware of, um, uh, but there might be some, some new ideas perhaps. Uh, I'll bring in a little bit more of the compassion-focused therapy angle because I'm a, a clinical psychologist as well, so I'm really passionate about that. Um, so there might be some interest in that. But um, a little bit more about me. Yes, uh, Felicia's right. I, I did my PhD looking at uh, parenting. Uh, so it was good training, uh, but I'm, I'm now being able to put into into uh, action. And that's my wife, Cassie, and we met doing our PhDs together. And uh, I developed a version of uh, of uh, the Triple P Positive Parenting Program for grandparents who provide regular care to their grandchildren. We've done a couple of RCTs of that now in, in Australia and Hong Kong, and just finished one in Vietnam. And um, I knocked that up, that program, in 2011-12, and it was near the back end of my PhD that I stumbled into the the field of mindfulness when I'm my first Vipassana retreat and, um, and then kept hitting myself over the head for not including more <laughs> of that within the intervention. So that was quite frustrating. But we've now included a compassion module within it and that was part of the, the RCT we did in, in Vietnam. Um, and then uh, I became very interested in, in compassion and spent a year at, at Stanford in 2016 and, and continued um, my research into that space. And I'm, I'm now a clinical lecturer at uh, University of Queensland School of Psychology. Um, and we've got, uh, I really enjoyed the teaching part, we have a, a fourth year seminar, uh, which is for our honours students, uh, where we teach compassion science, so that's just theories and, and, and models to understand compassion, and then we also have a postgraduate clinical elective, which is compassion focused therapy, that's being offered um, next year for the first time, so I'm very excited that we've managed to get two uh, compassion, one in undergrad and one in, in postgrad, so I'm very excited about that. We also have a lab. Uh, Compassionate Mind uh, Research Group. Uh, Stan, who's my kind of buddy in, in crime, I don't know if anyone knows Stan Steindl, he's a big motivational interviewer, uh, researcher and, and, and clinician. Um, we've been informally working on this work together for about the last four years, but formally at the university we've had our lab now going for the last uh, two years. Um, and that's our students there in the, in the, in the top right, and, um, and Paul was luckily with us last year, he's an honorary uh, professor at the university, he'll be spending three months with us uh, January to April next year, and I'm sure Paul and I will do some kind of workshop which we'll let people know about. And we also have our fifth year of the Compassion Symposium, so we've been doing compassion stuff you know, informally through the university, but it's much more formalised now. 
And we have our symposium on September 7th and 8th of this year. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Deborah Lee, who's uh, one of the uh, forefront clinicians in the treatment of trauma and PTSD. And she's been applying compassion focused therapy to that population. So if you're interested in that uh, therapy and in that population, she'll be running a workshop uh, the 5th and 6th of September. The keynote's free on the Friday night, and then it's a full day workshop on the Saturday. And we're inviting. Uh, call for papers across all of these different topics. I know you have your um, Compassion Healthcare uh, big grant and study that you're undertaking at the moment. Um, two individuals that do a lot of work in that space, I don't know if you know of um, uh, Nathan Considine and Tony Fernando. Um, they do a lot of work in Compassion and Healthcare. They've done some recent really interesting studies looking at barriers to compassion from nurses, uh, physicians and medical students. And they'll be running a one and a half hour workshop there that might be of interest, but uh, they've published quite a bit, Nathan and, and Tony, in that healthcare space and compassion and compassion barriers. Just to recognise some of the, the people's work I'll be presenting today, so I'll be presenting some of my students' work, so I have uh, five PhD students at the moment, and I'll be mentioning some of their work in passing, so I just want to recognise them, and the same as my master's students and honours students, and we've just had our first postdoc, my first postdoc just started with me a month ago. Uh, from Japan, Dr. Shia Sato, and we're looking at uh, compassion, how that uh, helps predict uh, help seeking behaviour um, of adolescents. So, we're starting to become a, a more vibrant group um, up at the University of Queen, so we're very excited about that. So, for today, I'll talk a little bit about compassion, but you guys already know this well, and then I'll talk about the therapy that might be newish. How many people know of compassion focused therapy? Well, okay. Perhaps not so newish. <laughs> and then I'll talk about some of our specific studies that I've been doing. Um, some are under review, some are ongoing, and some have been uh, published. And certainly plenty of time for questions at any point if you want to interrupt, but there'll be formal Q&A at the end. So I guess the first point is, is what is compassion? And when we think about this, uh, many different thoughts come to mind. Uh, when people think about compassion here, what, what, what immediately comes to mind? Anyone? If they think of compassion? I sort of think a non-familial, or not necessarily familial, or closely related love. Just kind of like another word for love and care that you um, extend to not necessarily people you, you actually know and feel love for. Okay. Mm -hmm. So certainly a love and care in the other aspect of um, the target could be yeah. not necessarily a close friend or family member, but in, all the self. Uh, mm -hmm. and, or all the self and across um, other sentient beings, not just not right. humans. Wow, there's a lot in that. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, when things come to mind with, when, when we speak about compassion? Anyone? A charity that sends me lots of junk money. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, a negative <laughs> association. Certainly a charity, okay, yep. Anyone else? Empathy. Empathy, yep. So they're often the key ones that come up. Empathy and love. Um, kindness also comes up quite a lot as another close familiar friend um, of compassion. Um, and when you're starting to look at it uh, from a sort of more scientific uh, perspective, there, there are various definitions and it becomes quite tricky. And you know, how compassion might look can differ, you know, if it's a friend, a stranger, um, an animal, so not a human. Um, this is my brother-in-law. He is a uh, firefighter, a volunteer firefighter. Uh, and so I think that's a, a great example of almost compassion in action. In, 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 in such a way he'll just get the signal on his pager that he has to run out and, 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 and sort of help in whatever that situation might be. And when he runs out the door to help someone, either prevent suffering from occurring or um, alleviate uh, that suffering uh, and, and try to stop to it, I don't think he's running out the door with sort of warmth and love. Often it's a sort of anxiety, right, or a real urgency or a real concern um, that kind of propels him out the door. Um, and so that led Paul and I to talk, Paul Gilbert, as Felicia was talking about earlier, to talk a little bit about other differences between things like kindness and compassion. And when you start to look at the various definitions um, of compassion, there's been many papers written about um, what compassion entails, what it involves. You know, Paul's definition incorporates two big parts. The first part is the awareness to uh, suffering, and then the second part is trying to do something about it, um, the, which is pretty much common across the definitions, but a, a unique aspect he kind of worked in was this idea of also prevention, trying to prevent, uh, prevent suffering from occurring. The idea there being 
not knowingly trying to, to cause harm. So not knowingly, you might unknowingly, but when you become aware of it, uh, hopefully you will then choose a wiser action. Uh, but those two parts are the key, being aware of stuff and trying to do something about it. There's a number of other definitions out there um, that I'm sure people are familiar with. Um, uh, but that's the, the general hallmark of uh, compassion focused therapy and compassionate mind training. And we were curious as to whether or not if kindness differs greatly to this, because a lot of people will use those just interchangeably, uh, kind and compassion, certainly love, um, altruism, you know, the number of those near pro-social terms, empathy, sympathy. And so we just did a study that's currently under review, and we put together 16 scenarios um, that kind of uh, was a kind of continuum, if you will, of kindness and compassion. Um, and you think of kindness as being sort of a generosity, um, uh, uh, you know, trying to be uh, friendly towards another, whereas compassion to keep up being more of a suffering component. So we put together 16 uh, scenarios to see how people uh, would just respond to them. We just simply said, do you think this is best categorised as a kind or a compassion scenario? So doing a favour for somebody that takes up your time. Uh, who thinks that's more kind? Compassion? Depends on the motivation. Yeah. Yeah, sure. There's an intention component. There's an intention component, but if given that scenario, what would you say? Kind? Yeah. Compassion? Out of our sample, only eight said it was compassion. The vast majority said that was more of a common scenario. Um, doing a favour for somebody that takes up your time. We then asked trying to console someone in distress. Kindness? Or would you say more compassion? Again, it depends on the why. Yeah, sure. Um, and we had uh, more, again, of course, say compassionate, but more, the, the ratio wasn't as strong. But certainly still quite overwhelming for us, because we didn't really have any a priori hypotheses regarding how people will respond. We actually thought, given how often people use the terms interchangeably, um, there would perhaps be a lot of um, uh, non-significant uh, findings between the scenarios that were offered in terms of being categorised kind and compassionate. But in all the scenarios, it was very clear that people either saw that one as kind or very clearly one as um, compassionate. Um, so we also were interested then in if they were seeing these scenarios in these different ways, um, with, with the emotions that they experienced, if they had to do that scenario, if they were the person in that scenario, would that differ? And we saw a different sort of pattern to it as well. And so the kindness is blue, the compassion is orange. And you can see for um, the compassion, we have higher sort of threat-based emotions experienced during the scenarios, so things like sadness and anxiety, anger and disgust. But when it comes to kindness, uh, joy was significantly more, um, uh, uh, on a scale of one to nine, was, 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 was more associated with kind scenarios. The compassion ones were seen as more meaningful, although, I mean, meaningfully, <laughs> is that different? But statistically it was, um, and the participants said, it was typical of them. And so it sort of started to give us an idea. We did some other aspects, but I think it's starting to give this idea that people do see kindness and compassion as being different. Um, and the emotional profile uh, to them are different as well. Um, so it does raise the question that, do you need kindness as part of compassion? Is that necessary? And are all kind acts have a compassionate component? And what we're kind of thinking is, for kindness, no, I don't think you need compassion because compassion has the suffering part. You can be kind without any suffering being being around. Can you um, tell us a bit about the participants? Who are these people? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, students. We had a student sample and also a community sample. So in our student sample, um, uh, there was one finding that was not significant between kindness and compassion. So that was listening to a friend who's distressed at work, a colleague that you don't sorry, listening to a colleague you don't like who's distressed um, and comforting them. They said it was 50-50 kindness and compassion, but in our um, uh, community sample where the, their average age was 40, um, they said that was very much compassion. And so it kind of gives us a sense that perhaps students haven't got a, a sense of what it's like to work um, 9 to 5 with colleagues that are sometimes difficult. Um, uh, so that, yeah, uh, we didn't really collect like much more <laughs> outside of that. But it's starting to just, I mean, none of this is, of course, definitive, but we're just trying to get a sense of, do people generally see the two as being different? And the key part, which was, was the suffering. As soon as you put anything in suffering, uh, it could be very minor in terms of trying to console someone who's distressed. There's something more major, standing up for someone who's being racially vilified. They saw as soon as that part came in, uh, it became a compassion categorisation. And then you see the emotional difference as well um, in the scenario. So that kind of gave us, and the, the targets here were always towards other. We weren't interested in relations itself. 
but there are many different sort of uh, sort of Paul refers to it as a flow of compassion. So of course, compassion to others is really important. A lot of work recently has been going on with self-compassion, um, with the self-compassion scale. So a lot of people have been using this measure, and there's a lot of work now sort of coming out, looking at the importance of how open you are to being, uh, how open you are uh, to receiving compassion from someone else. And um, some recent uh, studies showing that that's actually a very important buffer, your openness to being uh, receptive to compassion from another for depression, uh, a stronger predictor than self-compassion. Um, so that, that's interesting sort of space. And then, uh, of course, depending on the context, um, that flow will look differently. You could be high in one and, and sort of lower on another. And depending on context, it will show itself differently too. So culture, family, organisation, for example, that'll look quite different. And of course, each of those flows and contexts will also have different facilitators and inhibitors. So things that will increase the likelihood um, that compassion will occur and things that will diminish the chances of uh, seeing compassion occur. Are there any other questions at that point? So, I try to be kind and generous to at least one person every day. Oh, that's so sweet. Don't get too excited. Today, you are not that person. <laughs> so, that's kind of looking at the sense of, I can only give so much, then I'll get burnt out, or I'll have fatigue, it's like a muscle. If I, if I apply it too often, I'll, I'll start to um, wear it out. And also, perhaps, this idea of deservedness. Is their suffering really deserved um, of, of my help? Um, do I like them, for example? All these factors will influence whether or not compassion occurs. And there's a lot of research showing uh, strong associations between uh, trait levels of compassion and beneficial outcomes. So, and, and work certainly your, your unit here has done as well, a recent paper looking at health, self-compassion help, I think it was mediated the relationship between perfectionism and depression. Um, but certainly a, a range of other studies that have been If you've got higher levels of compassion, uh, it's associated with a number of important benefits. Uh, so what does that mean if you don't have high levels, if you're more lower? Um, you know, can you still get the benefits from it? Well, there are a range of interventions that have been developed to try to increase it. Uh, there's certainly your straight compassion meditations that people do, uh, the Stanford's uh, compassion cultivation training, uh, mindful self-compassion. There's a range of different interventions that try to cultivate it. Um, there's also uh, therapy, compassion the therapy, which I've been really drawn to, uh, which doesn't have a set time. It's, it's more of a therapy. So, for example, one trial, it, um, the sessions went for 26 sessions on average. These were uh, individuals with psychosis, with auditory hallucinations. Um, so it's not a set eight-week program or nine-week program, which these other programs tend to be. Cultivating Emotional Balance by Alan Wallace and uh, Eden Paul Ekman. They tend to be more eight, nine-week standardised programs. But we did a meta-analysis looking at the effectiveness of these compassion-based interventions. We had 21 randomised controlled trials involved. And what we found was uh, significant moderate effect sizes uh, for compassion, self-compassion, mindfulness at reducing suffering-based outcomes and also at increasing well-being. Uh, as part of those 21 RCTs, we also had six uh, RCTs that had an active control group. Uh, so that would be like a mindfulness-based intervention. Uh, with them included in the analysis, um, uh, those uh, results maintained, but um, with the actives, the, the effectiveness dropped. Um, so certainly, uh, they're not as effective when you're using an active control, which is standard uh, when you use any active control. Do I need to do it? Oh, no. So yes, I'm happy to send that paper if anyone's uh, interested in it. But um, a lot of the studies done with compassion-based uh, interventions still rely heavily on small samples, which is, again, something I think a lot of our, our psychological interventions struggle with a little bit. So I'll talk a little bit now about, that was just a brief overview of compassion, so I really want to get to the studies we're doing. Um, but I'll give also a little bit of background of compassion-focused therapy, although many of you already know it quite well. So CFT kind of came from Paul's work. Paul's an expert in treating depression. That's what he's been doing um, as his uh, sort of primary area of love, uh, if you can say that. Um, and he was a part of the NICS guidelines in the UK to establish what treatment should be used for the treatment of depression. Um, and CFT really tries to hit uh, the key variables of shame and self-criticism, which he was, uh, as part of the CFT model, was seen as being key factors that led to people uh, being depressed or maintaining depression. And David Barlow, uh, in a recent publication in Behaviour Therapy, it was a series of case studies applying CFT to these patients with PTSD, uh, sort of indicated that despite shame being a big process uh, issue for individuals with PTSD and depression, 
not many psychological treatments uh, actively go for those uh, processes. They more go for the uh, reduction in in, um, uh, uh, in in symptoms through exposure, but not so much dealing with the criticism and shame that's associated with it. Um, indicating CFT being very promising, and, and makes the point, which has been made by many others, that psychological intervention should really start uh, focusing much more on process uh, related change, which will deliver better outcomes as opposed to just trying to go for outcome related uh, shifts. Um, and certainly ACT is another example of that, right? So they always go for psychological flexibility has been a classic case of that's the process we're trying to hit. If we can shift that, then we'll be able to get better outcomes for, for our, for our um, individuals and our interventions. And so in terms of the evidence currently for CFT, there's been five RCTs and 34 uncontrolled studies. Most of the studies are done in service-based evaluations. So uh, in the NHS over there, a lot of uh, practitioners are implementing it as part of their care and evaluating it as part of that service-based delivery. Um, and certainly the idea of process-based care has, has got a lot of attention recently with uh, Stephen Hayes and Stephen Hoffman publishing a paper recently in World Psychiatry, sort of talking about this, this issue of moving towards more process. Uh, base models on understanding mental health. So what are some of the unique aspects of, of CFT? Well, it's informed by evolu an evolutionary model and also research done in your effective and developmental side. And it's really key parts are it's psychoeducation um, around understanding the brain as an evolved sort of organ, if you will. And as a result, we often use the phrase, it you know, has a lot of tricky aspects to understanding how this works and can get us caught up. Um, and then we also have this three-circle model of affect regulation um, that we use a lot with the client in order to formulate their current difficulties and where we want to move towards. And we spend a lot of time talking about the individual's resistance and fears and, and worries about compassion. So when you start to talk about um, a compassion with, the, with your client um, or in groups, we'll often ask them what do they think of when they think of compassion. Um, and get a sense of what, what it is that they view it as and then work with that. And um, a lot of motivational interviewing technique is used in, in that um, with the client. So in terms of the three circle model, um, this is influenced by a range of, of research in neuro and effective science. Um, the threat and self-protect system is kind of like the default operating system. So um, we call that creatively the red circle. Um, and in this uh, threat self-protect, the idea obviously, it's always running in the background. Um, it's going to hijack your attention if anything comes into to our, um, our peripheral or if we become aware of any threats. Um, they can be both external threats but also our own internal threats as well, the things that pop up into our mind. They're the things that will grab, grab our attention. And that'll stimulate this fight-flight sort of mechanism. So a lot of clients spend a lot of time in their red circle. Um, so, you know, it's important to look at emotions in isolation, but in CFT it kind of looks at the emotions more as what the functions are. And within this threat self-protect, the emotions that sort of go along there, of course, fear, anxiety, anger, uh, frustration, and so on. There's also another set um, of drivers around achievement or pursuing wants or things you really desire. So they may be things like um, uh, status, so getting a job, uh, moving up the ladder in your job, uh, finding a partner, uh, getting a house, a car, and so on. The things we're pursuing or wanting to achieve, and when we pursue those things, often we can feel a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, uh, and that can go along with things like excitement, joy, satisfaction. And then we have a third set, which is tied into this sense of being soothed or feeling connected. So this is this non-striving element. So a much more at, uh, a sense of calm and a sense of being content and, and somewhat safe. Um, not safety, that falls more here, but a sense of safeness. You're kind of just able to sit back um, and allow, allow yourself just to be. Um, and that's the, the, the kind of the three circle model. And these emotion systems can co-regulate each other. Um, and so what we notice is a lot of people come in, and this is a big issue for them because they're really worried or frustrated um, or even depressed. And they try to manage those emotions through pushing themselves to fix things. And often this, this green circle has gone missing. It's, it's not so developed. And you see this all of the time. So just to demonstrate this in a, a little, little video. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just... Uh... Are you psyching yourself up in the mirror? I do that sometimes before I go to a party where I don't know a lot of people. Stop sweating, you idiot. What is wrong with you, you stupid bitch? <laughs> 
So if we were to draw that out in terms of the three circles, and this is what we do with our clients, we'd ask them to draw their three circles with us in the session. Their red circle's hugely developed. And you know, so she, you know, Tina Fey there was really socially anxious, right? And to push herself to get to the party, that's what she wanted to do. She wanted to get to that social event. She was using her threat sort of assistant, if you will, to, to, to push her into moving into that blue circle. And when you rely on those sorts of two systems to regulate how you're going, you can start to become aware of failures, things that aren't going particularly well, uh, because you're not able to achieve what it is that you want. Um, or you might miss that level of achievement you're looking for, and so the disappointment hits. And when that disappointment or failure starts to occur, because this green circle is sort of not so active, you start to become quite critical and can be quite hostile and aggressive towards yourself and how you think you've gone or how you, how you think you've went. And often the belief is that if I do talk to myself in this way or relate to myself in this way, it will lead to improvement. Because if I'm not critical of myself, I'll become complacent. I'll let my standards drop. I'll, uh, um, I'll feel more at ease with mediocrity and that's not who I want to be. I have to make sure I'm critical in order to make sure I don't do that in the future. So we spend a lot of time trying to get a sense of what this criticism is doing for them, what's its function, and how does it actually uh, make them feel. And so we'll get them to draw it um, in therapy, and often um, the, the little green circle doesn't even appear on the page. And so we spend a lot of practices in order to try to build this sense of feeling connected. But a lot of people can be very scared of um, starting that process for various reasons, which I'll get to. But if we can enable a compassionate mind through building this kind of skill development around compassion, the, the, the model is such that we think it leads to a better uh, balancing between these systems. These are crucially important, all of them. You know, crucially important. You can't get rid of these things. You want them. I um, mean, even if you did want to get rid of them, you can't. Um, it's, it's kind of within us. So we have kind of use that a lot in terms of the de-shaming process with the client. It's not the fault this thing happens. This stuff happens. It's actually really important. It's sending us... It's trying to help us as best it can at this point, but we just need to help look at developing this guy a little bit more. So that's what we'll do with, with clients in therapy. Part of the reason of developing that green circle is it, it's kind of linked into this physiology of um, uh, parasympathetic system, sympathetic uh, system balancing. So Stephen Porges has written a lot about this. And if you're interested in heart rate variability, which is one marker of um, a health and emotion regulation, Julian Thay has written uh, a lot of work in this space. Um, and, and we've written a paper on, on it as well, how it links into compassion. Um, heart rate variability, the idea there is it's a marker for increased vagal tone. So when we're under distress, it can remain, our parasympathetic system doesn't diminish, it can remain active because the vagal tone is able to act as a break. Um, lower HRV has been found to be linked to a range of poorer outcomes. High HRV with uh, better outcomes, and there are uh, interventions. So this is just a brief two hour. Uh, Compassionate Mind Seminar, led by Marcelo Matos from Portugal uh, with Paul and colleagues, and they found through a two-hour seminar that aimed to, at specific practices, compassionate folk therapy practices, with a two-week opportunity to continue practice with audio exercises and practice diaries. Um, the intervention group uh, had increased HRV uh, at post uh, compared to the way it was controlled. So, and there's a range of other studies that have looked at just directly targeting um, compassion-focused uh, uh, strategies in, in the lab with increased heart rate variability. Importantly, though, there's also research that shows that, for example, Ken Goss, who does a lot of work with um, individuals with anorexia, as soon as you start to build compassion-based strategies in, their, heart, their HRV drops. Um, it takes about 20 sessions before they start to respond positively um, to compassionate practices. So it's not that everyone responds well to this, in fact. Often in the first instances, if people have fears towards compassion, they won't. In fact, they'll become more distressed. And it's important to talk about that if you're working clinically uh, with your patients and, and clients uh, so that they're aware. It's not going to just be this beautiful trajectory upwards. In fact, it's going to be a real struggle, potentially. And so, given that there's only been five RCTs, and the RCTs are varied in terms of what ingredients are in uh, that particular uh, study, we looked at developing a manual um, in October 2016. Um, Gary Burlingame, who works uh, a lot of group therapy at the University of uh, Brigham Young in Utah, uh, works in the hospital there and wanted to try compassion focused therapy for their in and out patient uh, unit. And so we worked hard, that's Paul and, and Nico Petrochi and my six month old son who was helping uh, make contributions to the manual. Um, we sat down, thought we'd knock this out 
in a couple of months. A year later, we, <laughs> we came up with the first iteration of it um, for, for, for Gary to use, and he's had 40 people through uh, the first trial of it. I was an RCT, just as a pre-post, and we're now making a host of revisions to that, um, which he will now use in a randomised controlled trial for his outpatient unit. So um, we're hopefully we'll have that ready to go uh, for the RCT by August of this year. If you're more interested in compassion focused therapy, I can send you some papers on it if you'd like some more information. But that's about all I want to talk about in regards to compassion and CFT. I was now just going to talk about the studies we've been doing looking at uh, compassion focused uh, projects. But are there any questions about CFT? No? Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the work I've been doing looking at inhibitors and facilitators and then some of the evaluation projects which are like uh, interventions, so RCTs. So the first one, this paper's currently under review, is, is fears of compassion. So there's a fears of compassion scales and, and we meta-analyse it to see what the associations were. Um, so most people think compassion is like this really great uh, uh, positive thing, but um, I'm really interested in these people who are really scared um, of compassion and they're frightened of it. No, I don't want any of that. Um, and when I first told my wife that I was interested in this, she kind of gave me this look and was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Who would want to do a meta-analysis to begin with? Um, but really, does fears of compassion exist? Is that actually possible to be fearful um, of compassion? And uh, in Paul's first group RCT um, of compassion focused therapy as a group, um, what they noticed with Sue Proctor was that, and they were the high, highly self-critical group, that many have had a real fear of being self-compassionate. These are quotes from the group, from the patients. If you get close to me, you'll see the bad in me. And if I get close to you, I'll see the bad in you. So you've got to keep an arm's distance. And so a lot of these individuals had had past experiences of being hurt by people who they really trusted. So like parents, for example. And so you must keep distance. And if you think about that in regards to compassion, it makes it very hard to be open to receiving compassion from another. Others have the power to reject and hurt me, they can turn nasty at, at any moment. So again, arms distance is best, it's kind of like a, a coping strategy, if you will. That's aiming to resolve a problem at the time, but can come with a lot of inadvertent long-term consequences. And so, they, what they were noticing is these critics had a lot of difficulty with self-compassion and, and being open to receiving it. And so that was done back in 06, and it took them many years to develop a scale um, in order to try to tap into this. And so it's got, uh, the scale has three uh, subscales, uh, one for self, one for other, and one for receiving. And there's been a lot of correlational studies done looking, um, and, and regressions done looking at um, uh, the fears of compassion. Give you a brief idea of what they, they look at. For others, you know, people take advantage of me if they see me as too compassionate. Compassion towards people who have done bad things is letting them off the hook. Um, there's some examples of some items. From others, I fear that when I need people to be kind and understanding, they won't be. When people are kind and compassionate towards me, I feel anxious or embarrassed and so on. And then for self, I fear that if I become too compassionate to myself, I will lose my self-criticism, my flaws will show. If I start to feel compassion and warmth for myself, I will feel overcome with a sense of loss and grief. So if this is the case, that the kind of uh, theory is from a CFT model is that much, the client is very much staying between the red and blue. And they're very fearful of getting into that green which is about um, uh, being open to warmth, affiliation, and, and connection. So this is what my project my master's student did, and my colleague, Jamin Day. And um, we also looked at a couple of moderators. We were interested in age, uh, when I found if it was published, uh, the sample, and also gender. And just some quick facts. We had 21 studies, over 5,000 participants across a range of countries. Most were cross-sectional surveys, but we also took data from eight, eight pre-intervention correlation studies, most were non-clinical samples, mostly female, uh, average age 30. We had no data over 45 years, so we don't know what this looks like in older populations. And um, just as a, a very brief overview, uh, for others, our effects that we were finding were 0.25, so that's smallish in terms of the correlation, but for shame, self-criticism, all in the way you'd expect, negatively associated with well-being, which is of course what you'd expect. But when we look from others, that the effects increase double, up over 0.5, all in the same direction, and then the same for self, uh, the same effects. And in terms of moderators, what we found was for others, the older you became, the greater the association was between fears of compassion for others and shame, um, and the same for women. I, I don't know why. 
um, I have no theory to that. Um, in terms of receiving, it was age and uh, clinical population. Again, this was to shame and self-criticism, those two variables. Uh, the relationship became stronger the older you were, and it was stronger for clinical populations to non-clinical, and that held for self as well. So, I mean, self and receiving is like an internal process, and you know, compassion for others is an external, so there might be something going on there in terms of the differences. Um, but that paper's currently um, under review. In terms of age, um, the relationship was stronger as it got older, but we didn't have any data over 45, so we don't know much about what this looks like. Um, in, I wouldn't even say old people, I mean, 50 doesn't sound that old, right? But we don't have data on that. So it'd be interesting to know what it's it looks very like. very compassionate of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because <laughs> I can sometimes think of it in both ways. Like my grandma, um, she seems, she's now 92, she seems to be getting worse the older she gets in terms of, uh, you know, labelling groups stereotypically and stuff. It can be quite embarrassing. It's like, man, <laughs> I don't know if that's, you can say that. <laughs> um, whereas my, my, my wife's um, mother, my mother-in-law, uh, Del, um, you know, she's 64 or whatever, and she just seems to become more liberal uh, the older she gets. So there's like this interest, interesting... Uh, now, obviously, there's, there's a continuum there, but we can become more entrenched in our beliefs or just more open because it's like, you know, with life experience and wisdom, you know, you don't get hung up on the small stuff. So it's an interesting kind of thing. So I think more work in older populations is, is very much needed, not only for fears, but also for uh, just compassion, self-compassion more generally. That research in older populations, there's not much either. I think there's only a couple of studies. So that was so. That's one inhibitor is your fears towards compassion will we'll block it. Um, I've also done some just experimental lab designs where we gave uh, participants a loving kindness meditation to see if that helped improve compassion. There's been some good meta analyses done looking at the fact that LKM facilitates compassion and self compassion. Um, so I was interested in uh, get, you know, giving loving kindness to, to individuals, seeing if it did increase compassion but whether or not if the person's fears acted as a moderator. So if you had high fears, did you not respond? And we did it for parents and then also for just the student population. So they'd get the loving kindness or um, loving kindness is like uh, wishing goodwill and happiness uh, to another um, and to self. And then you can extend that also as in almost all limitations to, to, to strangers and people you don't like, um, which we did in, in our practice, which was 15 minutes. And we also used the focus imagery exercise where the person was just instructed to imagine uh, different parts of their body, and that was it. We didn't ask them to do anything in relation to it, just think about it. And what we found was, again, if you had high fears, you just didn't respond. To, this is self-compassion score here. They didn't respond to the, the intervention, whereas um, uh, if you had low fears, you did. It improved. That was for young adults, and we were interested in if this could be helpful to improve the relationship between, uh, in terms of reducing conflict between the parent and young adult who lives at home with their parent. Um, if you had low fears, it did, but if you had high fears, you didn't respond uh, on that measure as well. And we also did it with parents, and we found the same thing. So uh, for parents, they also didn't respond to the love and kindness. I mean, it was just a one-off. It could be a case of this was just between groups. I mean, these studies are by no means perfect. But um, if you perhaps get more opportunity, maybe that might start to help you know, in terms of an exposure kind of uh, process, um, but a lot of research had been showing that if you just do this kind of stuff, even just one off through a letter writing exercise or a 15 minute meditation, you can benefit. Um, but we're seeing here if you've got a fear towards it, um, no they didn't. And uh, one thing we also did ask parents though, because I do work in parenting, if they liked it, and many said they found it acceptable, and 60% said they'd use it weekly. And this is a 15 meditation. And most parents will say that they haven't got the time to do anything. I'm certainly one of those parents. Yet they were saying that they would very much get into doing um, some kind of practice like this um, to help with their parenting. Uh, although 4% uh, did say it took too much time, but that's only a very small percentage of what we thought. But we're not the only people. There's a range of others who have also found that if you've got fears towards compassion, uh, not only did you respond, but also people responded more poorly, um, things actually got worse as a result. And so I think a key outcome of this is, particularly for therapists, um, where we're always trying to find something, right, um, to be helpful, 
but we just can't apply this stuff like a, as like a bag of tricks. Yeah, we'll just throw this out. This might be really useful. I know being kind to yourself is really important. I first want to explore how that individual sees kindness, warmth, compassion, uh, friendliness, because they will have um, uh, different relationships to that. And if you just start to engage it, it can be a real um, a blocker to the therapy. Um, the fact that in some of this research, the clients didn't come back. That was the, they, as soon as you introduce it, they had a fear. They didn't come back to the following session. So if you think about for some particular populations, uh, populations who have been the victims of sexual abuse, for example, that's a big impact um, uh, on the therapy. So we just you have to be uh, aware of that in how we deliver it. I won't go into that study because I don't think of time. I wouldn't mind talking about um, some work I'm doing developmentally. So this is other work I do um, with children. But uh, were there any questions about any of that kind of research? No? I mean, I think all that kind of makes sense. I mean, that study is just talking about how we're doing it now. We're doing uh, work in, uh, with fMRI where we're putting 20 uh, depressed individuals and 20 healthy individuals through the scan and where they uh, are given a life difficulty. So they receive their third rejection letter in a row, for example. And then we want to see how critical they are to themselves in that instance, or how reassuring they are. And then we follow that, those, those participants up two weeks later with a compassionate exercise. And then we follow them out two weeks again later doing HRV, looking at things between uh, their brain functioning and, um, in relation to criticism and reassurance and the compassionate intervention. So we just started that study now, and we'll be scanning next week. Um, but this is work I do with children, so that's my little boy, a little bit older here. And um, in, in, does anyone work with children, developmental research here? Yeah. Oh, a lot of people would, but I almost everybody's developmental here. Oh, really? But oh, not, no. not that young children. Oh, not that young. Not that young, yeah, okay. <laughs> the, the, tiny kids, yeah. The, this is work I've been doing with four-year-olds. Um, but in, in developmental literature, it's um, uh, a big motive uh, for children's stickers. They just go nuts for them. Um, and so we, we, we did an experiment um, with Mitchell, who's just started his PhD uh, with me, and Mark Nielsen, who does a lot of work in developmental research, looking at cultural differences. And myself, we gave ourselves the creative nicknames of Little Beard, Big Beard, Need and Beard. <laughs> He's trying to grow his out, but it's going slow. Um, but when you look at <laughs> That's incredible. That's, 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 that's a goal. Um, <laughs> when you look at compassion, the pro-social, uh, sorry, when you look at compassion in, in developmental literature, it's not often referred to um, much. So, I mean, if you look at some of the, the, the big researchers and, and developmental research, so people like Nancy Eisenberg, for example, they often look at uh, sympathy and empathy, um, uh, which, according to many defini defin definitions, are, are, are crucial parts to uh, compassionate action or leading towards compassion. But in the developmental literature, pro-social behaviour is what compassion, of course, would fall under. And pro-sociality just refers to any action that's intended to help another. Um, there's been some terrific studies showing that this emerges very early um, in life. Um, so is, are people familiar with the Wernicke and Tomasello uh, experiments? Have you seen those ones? Yeah. Um, I'll show you just a little bit of them. I mean, these, these experiments are just uh, fantastic. So the experiment is required to do a task here. We put the books in the cupboard. Ooh, we have an 18 months old fun. in the corner. Ah, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. there he goes. Prosocial, <laughs> not a psychopath. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, that's bad. I'm like, this is my favorite. Um, so here, uh, hanging up. The uh, uh, towel drops the peg. I like this bit. Oh, okay, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just see that this is straight away engaging in it all. Um, I'll just show this because this is also quite great. Um, so trying to stack the blocks. Look at the child's expression. Thanks, Joy, and help me. Certainly. Does it again? Oh. Now what he says, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's wrong with you? And then we go for And then it's the third time. He's like, what the hell? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> we can see there are some limitations, right? And uh, Felix and uh, 
and Tomasello, who have done amazing work looking at variations of these experiments. I mean, as soon as you change it to a Russian experiment, the child doesn't help as frequently as if it's an English experiment. Mm. So things like that will influence the pro-social helping. But they show that essentially these 18-month-old uh, children, 18 to 24 months old children across a variety um, of, of situations um, show this pro-social tendency or altruism. So that's trying to be helpful towards the other person. Um, Oh, no. yeah. So, altruism is, is trying to help someone else with their well-being. Typically, most people define uh, altruism as involving some kind of cost uh, to them for helping, so effort, perhaps. Um, whereas compassion, the key aspect is suffering. And, you know, Ricard talks about this in his altruism book, um, that, you know, the key difference between the two is altruism is well-being, compassion is suffering. So every compassionate action you could also argue it's being altruistic, but every altruistic motivated action is not necessarily compassionate. But of course they're heavily overlapping, right? It's very hard to uh, know even knowingly in yourself in the moment whether you're acting from an altruistic or compassionate base. But if you look at this pro-social literature, which is just very overwhelming that children are very helpful, um, the distress displayed by the experiment, I mean, they show goal interruption, but hardly distress, I would say. And the cost to help is also pretty minimal. So, I mean, the child is, is, is a passive observer. Um, they're not having to give up anything in order to help. And so they're able to provide that help pretty much spontaneously. So Mark, uh, in the Sysmate Review, noted that perhaps it's because the children don't have to have any cost incurred for the, the, the key uh, driver for their help. Because there's no cost, yeah, I'll be helpful. Of course I'll be helpful. Why wouldn't I be helpful? But as soon as a cost comes in, what happens then? So that's what we were interested in doing. So firstly, manipulating level of distress and also cost. And we did it with four-year-olds because we thought theory of mind would be important um, if, uh, because you, know, you want to get an idea of what's going on for the other person. Uh, they show robust spontaneous helping and they really like uh, completing tasks. So we had 73 children. And they go, uh, receive stickers if they, um, if, if, if they did the experiment. And the, the children just love the stickers. And so uh, they'd be completing the task with the puppet. And it was always the same task. They'd be completing them in parallel. The puppet would never have enough pieces to complete. Never enough pieces. And the puppet would either be really upset about that or not upset. And then uh, the child would either have no cost, so they had excess resources, that they could um, give the puppet to complete, so both could get a sticker for finishing, or they would just have enough pieces to get the sticker themselves, and if they had to give up a piece, it means they wouldn't get a sticker. So it was a two by two, essentially, with the, with the uh, no upset being pro-social helping, and with distress put in, the upset being compassionate helping. So I just want to show what this experiment looks like. Um, I mean, does anyone have any hypotheses on what they think will happen? Do you think children will help in the cost conditions? Are all Anyone? these children getting rewards? So yeah, so that... Have all been promised a reward for... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So in advance, so this is what you see right at the beginning. And then I'll ask you again. So... So we introduced the paradigm. Okay, so before we start, I have all these stickers. So they choose their favourite stickers. Do you think you can pick your favourite three stickers from these ones? What's your favourite three ones? So they pick their favourite, the and play. then we, after they pick their favourite, we then go, if you complete this task, you'll get those stickers. And we're going to play this game, Terry the Tiger. So you can see they engage with the puppet straight away. Are you? Well, look, so these are the pieces for this game. So then you explain the, the task. So I'm going to explain to you both know how to play. Eric can get his puzzle all finished before I say stop. He can win one of his stickers. Do you think you understand? Yes. And do you think you understand? So should we play? Okay, let's play. So are there any questions at this point about the design? No? Do you think it'll be helpful? This is no cost here and the puppet's not upset. He thinks it will help. Not help, so mostly help. Good intuition. I mean, the reason why we use puppets is because um, uh, children do engage them as if they're an agent. Um, if it's an adult, it's like a power differential and they're much more likely to comply when it's an adult. So hence why we use the puppets in developmental research in these conditions. I think it's
Oh, oops. Mm -hmm. I thought I could turn that off and turn yeah. the volume. Pete, no. I can help him. I'm sure. So it just spontaneously helps. I'm sure. It takes joy in helping. As soon as you put um, a cost in, so again, not upset, but there's a cost. Oh, well, looks like I get my stick up. And we give three prompts, so there's three opportunities for the child to help. So we prompt them three times. I can't complete it. No, I can't get my stick up. Looks away. Oh, well. It doesn't help. So now we're distressed. Now I can't wear my stick up. So you can hear the emotional tones really different. Get but look at the behaviours of the child. <laughs> oh, I just need two more pieces. Oh, I'm so upset. I think I'm going to cry. Oh, I really wanted to wear my sticker. <laughs> <laughs> they completely start to disengage. And that happens across all of them. So in the next one, she becomes fixated with the with the marbles, and then in the next one, she starts playing with her. Oh, hang on, let's go for She starts to play with her um, sandals. So we thought we'd just direct requests, ask. Do you think you could help me? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So children, you know, they... they <laughs> If there's a sticker involved, all bets are off in terms of being helpful. But I mean, we must show um, at least yeah. one demonstration. Oh, I'm so upset. I just need two more pieces and then I can get a sticker. Oh, I really wanted to wear my sticker. Oh, I think I'm going to cry. I really wanted to wear my sticker, but I can't. I just need two more pieces. What am I going to do? Oh, so sweet. Oh, are you helping? Thank you. So, I mean, that's very sweet, right? Um, she didn't help in the next two, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, very sweet. So, what we're seeing here, so this is helping behaviour here. Um, when there's no cost, it's at ceiling. They help all of the time. If they help before a prompt, they get the maximum four points. If they help after the first prompt, they get three points and so on. But as soon as you put the cost on, we had full response. The children just never helped um, uh, the puppet. We thought you'd, we'd see more helping when the puppet became upset. Uh, there's a slight trend there maybe, but it certainly wasn't significant. Um, so what we did is we did the experiment again, but this time we used the minimal group paradigm in it too, where we put the child um, in uh, the yellow group and the puppet in the yellow group, and we thought if they were in the same group, maybe that might lead to more helpful behaviour. Um, and uh, the other thing we did was also we coded for consoling and disengaging. So we thought, okay, maybe they're not giving up the sticker, but many of the children would offer at times uh, consoling behaviour, so passive responses like, oh, it's okay, maybe next time. Uh, they never gave it up next time anyway, but they would still say that, oh, maybe next time, or stroke the puppet. Um, and others would just disengage and turn completely away. So we, we wanted to code for that to get a, get a sense of how often this was occurring. Um, so we had 84-year-olds this time, Maya did this work, and again, um, this we only looked at cost and distress, and in terms of helping behaviour, it was extremely low again. Um, they just weren't helping. And then when we even put them in the same group and made reference to that when distress, oh, we're on the same team, you're going to get one and I'm not, they still didn't respond. So cost is acting as the key driver to whether or not the child will be helpful. In terms of consoling, um, you can see the level of consoling in white is quite low. Most don't console the puppet when they're distressed. In terms of disengaging, what happened, which we didn't think would happen, is when they were in the same team, there was far more disengaging occurring when they weren't in the same group. So yeah. our sense was the child felt, you know, got a sense of, I should probably help. Um, and that was really distressing, so they disengaged from it so they wouldn't feel the distress. Um, that's kind of our working model um, at the moment. Um, so we're now looking at this experiment again and manipulating cost a little bit. But group membership didn't help, helping was still low. Um, and disengagement was high when they were in the same group. And so that's been published in a, a British Journal of Developmental Psychology. In terms of evaluation projects, um, we've just finished uh, an RCT um, looking at um, compassion focused therapy for uh, depressed LGB uh, individuals, lesbian, gay, and bisexual. And that's work with uh, collabora collaborators at Latrobe, and we're doing work with Clinics as well. Um, should I finish up? It seems like People. Sorry, we have a meeting. Oh, yeah, no, 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 it's totally fine. No, no, we should just stop.
Great Mac. Sorry? You're not sure it's stolen. No, 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 Are you sure? Wind up. Wind up. Okay, yeah, wind up. Well, this is just the very end anyway. And so in LGB populations with depression, there's a lot more distress, a lot more suicide ideation. Um, and so we uh, had our exclusion criteria, inclusion criteria and everything, and these are our collaborators in the project. And what we found, and we give them a range of uh, practices that they'll do weekly with a, a therapist that they, it's delivered online um, through Skype. Um, and then they'll, uh, it's eight weeks and they'll do their um, practices uh, during it. And uh, what we found was significant decreases uh, for our variables of interest, so depression, uh, suicide ideation, um, and shame as well. So that was with uh, 40, um, in, in that was a small scale RCT, so we're hoping to get funding to do this was This um, was a, a online but live? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so, so just through Skype. Yeah. So it was still uh, face to face, but through, through a yeah, Skype mechanism. Yeah. Do, you know, do you have any sense of how much difference that made? Uh, having the peer support. Well, no. No, I mean, sorry, the therapist. Uh, uh, having it on uh, Skype versus uh, oh, on face live. to face. Uh, you know, mm. face to face rather than face to screen. Yeah, I, I get you. Um, I think the literature in that field kind of shows that you can build up just as, as good as working alliance as if they were face to face. So I think mm -hmm. it is a, quite a good option, uh, particularly for rural based um, individuals. Um, so I think that that's quite a a robust literature that you mm -hmm. can still get quite a good alliance there. Um, it was a self-help program. It would be interesting to see how it's self-help alone mm -hmm. and then therapist mm -hmm. um, come, uh, with self-help, how that would look. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also looked at it with parents as well. So that was just integrating the work I've done in parenting with my compassion research. And we did a very brief intervention with mothers uh, in the first 24 months um, after birth because uh, a lot of uh, mothers uh, can go through um, uh, distress post birth because the, the, the birthing process is, is traumatic, or the experience of breastfeeding those first uh, 24 months is also distressing. And so that can make me feel shameful, um, there's something wrong with me because I'm not enjoying it, for example. And so this is work I did with Amy and Cora and Stan, and we gave them uh, two 10 minute videos plus a tip sheet. There was no control condition here, but we were interested to see if we could improve compassion and flexibility. Uh, psychological flexibility and also uh, decrease uh, stress symptoms and uh, increase breastfeeding uh, satisfaction. And from a very light touch intervention, we're seeing some nice small effects. Of course, we don't have a control comparison, so that could wash out completely. Unfortunately, we've got nothing on shame. So, I mean, shame is a hard nut to crack. So, I mean, it's very unlikely we get anything in a light touch intervention. So our future research, we are now doing, a, a, we're running a pilot at the moment with obese um, uh, individuals who have high levels of body weight shame. So we're running the, the manual that we've developed with them in a pilot to then do an RCT. We've just started um, doing the same manual but as a couple program. So the veteran with PTSD with their spouse to do it. So see how it works um, uh, as a couple in the intervention. And I'm just starting, um, we're just recruiting parents at the moment for a brief seminar of compassion and mind training to help with parenting. For, for, for parents who are highly self-critical. And we're doing further work with the compassion paradigm with children and obviously the neuroscience scan too. I had a little exercise that sort of linked into shame, but I, I, won't, I won't touch on that because it's uh, too hard to explain in a short time. But if you want any of our resources, they're all for free on the, on the website, so you can jump on and grab them if you, if you so wish. But hopefully you're left with the idea that compassion can be very helpful uh, for our well-being. So thank you very much. Any questions? What, what, tell me your distinction between uh, compassion and altruism. Okay, yes. Um, so what we, how we argue it, and um, this is uh, sort of based on Matthew Ricard as well, is when the wish is altruism, you're very keen on the other person's well-being. So they don't have to be suffering, but you can help increase their well-being and um, be kind or friendly, as it were, towards them. And so that kind of fits into this loving kindness perspective. Um, so that's altruism. Um, often people say with altruism there should be a cost as well to that. Um, so it's effortful. It's effortful to engage in that altruistic act. For compassion, the person has to be clearly suffering, and then you're trying to alleviate the suffering. So the motivation is to reduce suffering, uh, alleviate in some way. Whereas for altruism, uh, the person doesn't have to be suffering. However, you know it becomes then well. You know, a compassion act can also be considered altruistic because you're reducing suffering that's increasing well-being potentially. 
um, as a result, you'd think. Um, whereas if it's altruistically motivated, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be compassionate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's a little tricky. Yeah, yeah totally, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, trying to yeah. work out what it is. Yeah. But what we kind of suggest, the, what, what the kind of scholars kind of suggested, if it's noticeable, the person is clearly suffering and you're going to help, well, that would be a compassionate intention, primarily is what they argue. Whereas if it's clearly not, they would say it's more altruistic or kinship care, which ties into uh, kindness. So kindness is generosity, trying to uh, be uh, generous. And, and yeah. In your experiments with uh, uh, the children, in one of the Thomas Sellers experiments, they showed that actually not only not paying a cost, but getting rewarded actually decreased the yeah. amount of that behavior. How do you fit that in with your theory of cost? So those are those experiments when it, they're, they're getting a reward, so it's an intrin extrinsic kind of help. It deplete, depletes the intrinsic. They get that cool kind of motivation. That they stick in the machine. And yeah, they, yeah, yeah. And then they help less after being rewarded for it, which seems actually not only reducing costs, but giving them benefit from yeah, helping, yeah, yeah. and yet it reduces helping. Oh, I think it's a great. But no, but so what's your account for that? Because oh, it sounds like you're introducing the opposite theory here, which is if you have to pay a cost, you're going to yeah. be less likely. Less yes, likely to help. Well, I mean, I think a lot of people rationalize it in terms of. Uh, if 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 I get the reward for helping, I'll only help then once I get once I get the reward. So if I don't get the reward every time I help, I'll be less likely to be uh, driven for the internal kind of kick from being help from being helpful. I think that's the general kind but of. But if you don't reduce so the reward to begin with. Yeah, if you don't. Yeah, exactly. So if you don't have the reward to begin with, then internally they would get a kind of warm glow as it were from helping. But when you start to pair it with the external. Uh, to actually get something physically. That I mean, that, that, that is there because I'm trying to get at your opposite one here. Yeah, right? yeah. Because you're saying, oh, if I pay a cost, I no longer want to help. But yeah. you would think from that same attributional approach, if I pay a bit of a cost, I actually get more internal rewards for help. Well, I don't think they do, though, because the children don't get more internal reward, do they? Because they, they don't help unless they get the external rewards. No, I think attributionally, if you mm -hmm. think I actually paid a cost when I helped, I feel even more altruistic. Mm. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Um, but I'm, okay, but it's a little bit opposite of what you're getting in your findings. That I'm, I have a theory about Yeah, that. please, and share. Yeah, 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 your whole thing is taking under the structure of rewards. You start yes, the yes, whole paradigm yeah, with yeah. do this and you'll get rewards. Yeah, yeah. And so we don't really see yeah. the natural yeah. uh, propensity yeah. under yeah. that condition. Yeah, we're doing that test exactly now. Okay. So we have no reward. So it's just you do the task and see how they respond. Yeah. And okay. that's what we're collecting data cool. on right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. That's a great point, yeah. So in that experiment, what we do is, it's the same distress cost um, condition we're looking at, um, but uh, they give up the, the, the internal sort of, I've finished the task, uh, but they get no sticker. So that's one condition. Uh, the second condition, we introduce the stickers again, but as soon as they complete it, the experimenter comes out of being the puppet and gives them immediately the, the stickers and then they go back to finishing the task the puppet and they go, I'm really upset. And then we want to see, well, the children can be helpful there and give a piece and they can both get a sticker. And then in the third condition, um, it's the exact same um, to, to have a comparison against. So um, our, we think there would be much more healthy without the sticker rewarding, but we'll see. And that would, as you say, um, yeah. go on to confirm what they also think. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, pathological altruism. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have read a bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's been findings as well that there's a genetic component which mm. makes people addicted to altruistic behaviour too, mm. so they get a high like drugs mm. and gambling and, and so on. Um, if that's have, is it true at all, um, and there is a very close link to compassion, and you get the, the difference is just that that suffering component mm. could not to then people effectively get burnt out from being mm. so compassionate continuously, mm. and actually cause harm to themselves, but also the person they're compassionate about. Yeah, and I guess that, that's a great question. I guess that ties into that flow element too. So if you're only directed outwards, that's only one aspect of compassion. So how are you at being open to still receiving it from others and how do you go about giving it to yourself internally as well? But if it's always outwardly focused towards the target, I think there are risks involved. So, for example, in the nursing literature, um, it's interesting. Um, there's been a lot of work done qualitatively where um, you know, there's a compassion fatigue scale in the protocol um, measure. 
and what the nurses often say is, yes, but uh, if the demands weren't so high on me at work by my employers and we had other nurses and other resources here, I could, could spend more time with my patients and be compassionate with them. And so that's where contextual factors within the organisation inhibit the opportunity at directing compassion towards another because they don't feel like they're uh, properly resourced. And so whether or not if that's fatigue, these nurses are already feeling high levels of burnout and stress, but that's because of the demands placed on them um, with a shrinking budget, more responsibility. Uh, but if you gave us more, we could be more compassionate uh, is really interesting. Uh, but certainly I've read about that pathological uh, altruism. And certainly I think there must be something there. I just don't think it's, they're still trying to understand it um, and how it operates. Mm. So in your experience with the kids, what were the demographics? Did you look at birth order at all? And <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. So when you try to get uh, kids in to do the experiment, yeah. it, 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 as soon as you start asking those uh, demographic questions, parents just don't participate. It's a real uh, barrier to getting children in. But certainly in pro-social literature, the older you are, typically yeah. the more pro-social they are. Or, but we didn't look at that. Or within birth order. And, yeah, sure. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, so I was just curious. No, we didn't look at that, no. And so we're also interested in other things like, you know, if the child spent time with the puppet and bonded with yeah. that and shift. We we're also doing another study, Mitchell's just doing a study at the moment where we look at, at doing a, a prior ostracism. They're watching an ostracism video mm. or a, um, yeah. just another control video um, to see if that then leads to increased helping. Because there's work looking at that with Harriet Over, so she's a dog, so we're working with her on that. Yes, it does. In fact, we'd like to do it with two year olds too to see if. To see how it unfolds with the younger pop. Uh, researcher Slet Nova, I think her name is, did it with two year olds uh, in relation to the experiment of being cold, and the child would give their blanket to them. Um, but I think the difficulty within that experiment was uh, they were getting the blanket back. <laughs> so it was kind of like, would they be willing to forego it regardless? So, but it was really interesting work with two year olds. All right, I think we're great. Well, thank you. Very much. Oh, all right. <laughs>